My name is Virginia Hall, and I'm here today to introduce you to Roger Rule, author of The Rifleman's Rifle and host of this series of episodes, Special Guns with Roger Rule. Thank you, Virginia, and welcome, and welcome viewers to my 23rd episode of this series. And what do you have for us today? The gun I want to cover today is a rifle that is very similar to the rifle we covered in episode four. It's a big bore double rifle specifically designed for big and dangerous game. Uh, there are, however, several differences, and one is major enough to include this rifle in this series in addition to the rifle of episode four. That rifle was a box lock rifle, and while very well made, was produced from modern CNC methods and finished with a minimum of hand work. The differences for our rifle today are that it is a side lock double rifle and one made totally by hand, an old world, old school representation of the true art of the gun. The maker is one of the most prestigious gun makers in the world. And although a, a work of art, the rifle is still made to function as a tool, yet a tool that would, be, would impress any professional hunter. In episode four, we covered the history of the development of the big bore double rifle and the purposes for which it was intended. I don't wish to bore the viewers with repeat information, but if you're interested in learning more about the history of the rifle today and have not viewed episode four of this series, I refer you to that video to understand how the big bore double rifle came about. But briefly for this video, <clears throat> I'm going to include just this much. It was during the uh, heyday of safari hunting in the last two centuries that big bore double rifles emerged as the perfect medicine for the biggest and most dangerous game. It was pointed out that these early double rifles had two separate locks with exposed hammers and that eventually the double rifle evolved into the modern era with a box lock action and internal strikers it no longer had exposed hammers. However, I also mentioned that even after the box lock double rifle became more common for safari use, many hunters still preferred the side lock double rifle for insurance. When a hunter is armed with a side lock double rifle in a bush, far from a gunsmith assistance, if one lock malfunction, the other lock, being totally independent, still allowed the hunter a serviceable weapon, albeit uh, with only one operating barrel. Consequently, retro back to the side lock, that rifle for insurance is what we have here today, a fine example of the very treasured big bore double rifle made for dangerous game, still made with two independent locks. It is the side lock ejector double rifle, and it's the best gun to boot, being made by uh, Best World Maker. Who's the maker of this gun? Uh, the maker's name is Johan Fonsoy, an old and uh, renowned company established in 1790. Where are they located? Uh, Austria, um, in the Pantheon community of uh, Austrian gun makers, the small town of Furlock. Uh, located in the south of Austria. The, the Johann Fonzoy Company is the Michelangelo of Furlock gun makers, having received uh, the equivalent of the royal warrant of Austria by being designated as the purveyor to the imperial court of Emperor, Emperor Franz Joseph I. That was in 1906. But the company looks back on a tradition of fine craftsmanship upheld for eight generations under the Fanzoi name. Do they make a lot of guns? Every year, only a small number of exclusive rifles and shotguns leave the Fanzoi workshop. Each firearm is an amazing work of technical engineering and an object of beauty with cultural value. Their gun-making artistry has propelled the company into uh, the worldwide elite of specialty and boutique firms making only best guns. Here's a little history of the company. World War I and World War II hit the Fanzoi family hard economically. 
the handmade best gun business diminished after World War II. At the end of the war in 1946, there were 56 gunsmith companies in Furlock. From then until now, there are only a handful of highly specialized family firms left that continue to build handcrafted hunting firearms. After the Second World War, the family member, Johann Fonzoy, began his turn at ownership and management of the company. He was successful in expanding the company to worldwide recognition and opened new areas of business and trade. As an avid hunter himself and world traveler, Johann was the first Furlock master gunmaker to go on safari in Africa in the 1960s. His trip initiated the era of large caliber double rifles built in Furlock, and specifically those crafted in the Fanzoi Company under his name. They have become highly esteemed working rifles among professional hunters in Africa. Johann's good relations with high-profile personalities and VIPs led to Fanzoi's hunting arms becoming treasured gifts presented by and to heads of state. Today, Johann's son, Patrick Fanzoi, who has been in charge of technical management since 2005, became general director in 2016. Under his tutelage, they built a new facility and the company, Johann Fonzoy, received the status of manufacturer. This is a national standing, recognizing them as having the machinery and technical skills for making all components in-house. Each and every product is designed and built within their workshop by a team of highly skilled and enthusiastic craftsmen who combine centuries-old knowledge of the traditional techniques of gun making with the state-of-the-art manufacturing technology. Their in-house production allows complete control over every step of the gun making process. This guarantees the highest quality. That sounds like they make a lot of guns. I'm told that each Johann Fonsoy rifle or shotgun is planned and built one at a time. They're not a volume producer. They claim that skilled um, manual craftsmanship makes up about 80% of the total work involved with hundreds and sometimes thousands of hours involved in a single project. All engravings are executed by hand by master engravers. I'm hearing another expensive rifle. Well, let's first take a look at it. Is this a new gun? No, it was built in 1970. As I said, Johann's first hunt in Africa was in the 60s. -hmm. This rifle is one of his early doubles. It's a three-digit serial number, 495. What's the caliber? It's chambered in 500-465 Nitro Express, a large bore Mm -hmm. centerfire rifle cartridge developed by Holland & Holland of London and introduced in 1907. It's very similar to the more well-known 470 Nitro Express, like we did in episode four. Does this rifle kick as bad as the rifle from episode four? Actually, I have not shot this rifle um, before, so I don't know. But let's go to the range and find out. Virginia has just asked me how this rifle kicks, and I don't know because I haven't shot it before. We're here at the range of my club, 200 yard range. Here's the ammo, it's 500-465 Nitro Express. It's a hand load of Champlin firearm, 480 grain bullet. I'm going to load it. Just one round. Take it off safe. And you can see, I don't think the actual kick was as bad as it probably looks on camera. So Virginia, for your question about the kick, we found out that wasn't that bad. Uh, 
which is a credit to the weight and design of the rifle. And let's turn our focus to its features. As, as I said, this fits in the special gun series because it's a side lock, double barrel rifle mm -hmm. instead of a box lock. Also, it's handmade. Being a side lock, double barrel rifle, it has two locks. Um, each one, which mechanically controls one trigger, one sear, one striker, and one barrel, each independent of the other, and mounted on opposite sides of the receiver. Let's look at the metal work first. As you can see, the action components are finished with color case hardening. This is the finish of the locks, the top and bottom of the receiver, the top tang, and the top action uh, lever and the forearm is cushioned with the Anson and Dealey release, which you can't see from this view. We covered case hardening in our episode three. The result often resembles oil floating in water. Or is it the other way around? Other metal parts are blued, the trigger guard bow and the lower tang, the safety lever and the barrel and the sights. This rifle has nearly full coverage hand engraving and tiny arabesque scrolls by a Johann Fonzoe master engraver. It's not signed, as is the custom and common practice of German and Austrian gun makers. The engraving on this one looks so tedious. You're right, it is. Another important metal feature that I should point out is that this double rifle has what we call bolstered frame having additional metal reinforcement which widens the receiver and extends up and joins the fences. This additional reinforcement is needed on big bore double rifles. Also, the fences are, uh, have side clips, beveled flanges extending forward from the sides of the receiver that made up with beveled sides of the barrels. As part of the uh, aesthetics, the fences are also beaded, another touch only found on best guns. First, we'll check for, uh, for the safety when I pick this rifle up. <clears throat> oh. Oh, from the top lever to the right, traditional. You can see the chambers are empty. <clears throat> And co uh, covering more of the outward metal features, looking at the side locks, we can see the seven pin uh, locks with, e with an easy count of the stainless pins. And there's a large gold pin with a raised bar just above the trigger uh, bow. These are cocking indicators. When angled from 7 o'clock to 1 o'clock on the right side and 5 o'clock to 11 o'clock on the left side, both actions are cocked. In other words, if the bar is slanted, it's cocked. When not cocked, the indicators are lie level or in the horizontal plane. The two triggers are contoured with hand checkered faces for better control. And the front trigger is articulated, which means the front trigger is hinged, built to cushion its impact on the shooter's trigger finger during recoil when the rear trigger is pulled. The action lever or top lever is nicely engraved with the border surrounding the checkered steel on both sides for non-slip control. The safety also has a border uh, surrounded checkered steel with a raised knob facilitated sliding motion. When on safe, the word safe shows in gold fill letters. Slide it forward and the word safe is concealed and now the rifle is ready to fire. Looking at the underside of the receiver, we see that each side is scalloped to mate to the stock and the Anson and Dealey release is in a semi beaver tail forearm is inlaid and recessed in a nicely grooved elliptical cutout and into the walnut. Barrels are 24 and a half inches long. When the action is open, we see the greener cross bolt that's slotted into the top of the action and an extension of the uh, quarter rib. The quarter rib is hand engraved with cross hatching between two and graved borders or boundary lines, 
which are interrupted with a narrow flat area showing the maker's name and city. I have to turn around this way so you can see it. Johann Fonzoy Furlock, Austria. The rib carries a uh, rib uh, carries an express sight with three leaves, one standing and two folding. All feature uh, gold-filled vertical center lines for quick eye alignment to their uh, shallow V notches. The two folded leaves are marked 200 and 300. The fixed leaf is also a shallow V notch. These are preferred by professional hunters hmm. for fast sight alignment when hunting dangerous game. The quarter rib ends with a cone, sh rib, uh, kind of a sculpture, and it's a cone-shaped terminus that I call it, that makes an interesting transition to the smooth concave rib of the barrels. The, this terminus is uh, a pleasing piece of sculpture which resembles the uh, cr uh, cross hatching and matches the style and shape of the front sight ramp which carries a single silver front bead. The safety located on the top tang behind the top opening lever in the traditional posi position is manual. It's not automatic, which is the preferred type of safety uh, for a dangerous game rifle. If you have fired both shots and uh, a wounded animal turns to charge, you want to be able to immediately eject your empties and reload under pressure, you don't want to have to think about t taking the safety off, which uh, would require an additional step. Mechanically, besides having two best built seven pin side locks, the action is the time tested purdy underlug system with two purdy underlugs and a third locking greener cross bolt. It is configured with side clips, a locking screw, on the action screw, bush strikers with locking screws, and intercepting sears. Besides the articulated front trigger, the barrels are automatic ejector barrels, which mean the shells once fired are ejected or kicked out of the gun uh, when it's opened. When they're not fired, the cartridges are simply set up to be removed manually. I've demonstrated the automatic ejectors before in several videos almost hit you one time. I think the first time was in uh, episode four, so I won't bore you with that repetition. I'd like to emphasize the mechanical feature of bush strikers. These allow easy access for firing pin repair or replacement. You can't see them here, I'll show them to you on the side table. But bush strikers indicate a very high quality gun, and these are not only bushed on this rifle, but they also have locking screws. Another giveaway that it's handmade. <clears throat> we'll show a close-up of those in a moment. Now let's turn our attention to the wood. Nice wood on this one again. I like the dark streaks on the grain. The dense dark English uh, walnut stock would be classified as fancy grain with the right kind of figure for rifle needing a strong stock mm -hmm. for to withstand recoil. The figure comprises uh, mm -hmm. contrasting dark and light parallel streaks that are not only attractive but also set in the correct direction for stress. And the shape of the stock feels perfect as the gun comes to the shoulder with precise alignment on the target. Looking at the design, um, the stock is made with a pistol grip. The comb is a classic comb without a Monte Carlo and it's not fluted but carries a nicely sculptured European cheek piece with a shadow line or contoured bead. The forearm wraps around the barrels, but it's so slender and well done, it'd probably be described as a semi-beaver tail forearm. Mm -hmm. Where the forearm meets the action, there's a pleasing curve design that accentuates the curve of the scallops mating of the side locks on the underside. The checkering is hand checkered and executed uh, flawlessly at 22 lines per inch. The points of the diamonds are crisp and still sharp with no diamonds missing. 
On the pistol grip, there are two panels of checkering, each ending with two point pattern with double borders behind the side locks. Uh, the stock carries the traditional English teardrops or drop points. First explained in episode 7. Mm -hmm. The pistol grip is capped with a buffalo horn uh, pistol grip cap and, and an engraved screw. The forearm checkering is also generous. Four point pattern that wraps around in front of the ensign and daily release. With, uh, it terminates with a pleasing V-shape at the nose. Again, the checkering is well executed at 22 lines per inch and surrounded with double borders here. The wood to metal fit is meticulously done, uh, as you would expect on a best gun. The butt of the stock has a traditional silver's red rubber recoil pad, an African favorite that withstands weather better than a leather covered re recoil pad. The final finish of the wood is a hand rubbed French oil polish. The rifle's length of pull is 14 and 3 uh, fourths inch. It has a he it's a heavy gun, weight is 11 pounds 2 ounces, a weight the shooter appreciates when he's subjected to recoil, as I just discovered. So now we'll disassemble the gun and uh, and look at the components. To disassemble it is the traditional takedown. First pull down the ensign and daily release lever to remove the forearm. Then pressing the top lever to the right, lower the barrels from the action. And the barrel simply is freed and separates. This rifle comes with two uh, of the maker's cases, a leather presentation case and a water resistant steel case. I have here the oak and leather case with the components compartmentalized. The accessories include 500 465 snap caps, a nickel oil bottle, and a uh, little key over here in the compartment. Looking at the uh, receiver first, the side clips show predominantly when the barrels are not attached. The side locks fit so tightly their separation from the receiver is indistinguishable with the wood to metal fit being perfect. Notice also the seven pins of the side locks and the cocking indicators. Inside the action we see the bush strikers. They're clearly, clearly visible now showing their locking screws which, as I've said, is another indication that it's handmade. When I move the top lever to the right, you can see the two locking lug bolts move in the water table. These lock into the lugs on the barrel flats. And you can also see the movement of the greener top cross bolt, which is the third fastener at the top of the receiver. Inside on the water table, we see the serial number 495 and the date of manufacture, 70, and two Austrian proof marks. Notice the rectangular hole that uh, through the bottom of the receiver where one of the barrel locking lugs protrudes. When this occurs, the mating lug on the barrel is engraved and finished to blend in and match the bottom of the receiver. While I have the receiver here in this <coughs> close venue, Notice, note the locking screw on the action screw and also note that they both are indexed, uh, lined up together. True sign of a best gun. Let's look at the barrels next. <clears throat> we see the automatic ejectors and under those the big locking lugs for the locking bolts on the receiver on the front lug, you see the semicircle cutout, which matches up with the hinge pin in the receiver. On the backs of the lugs, you see these cutout uh, square notches that re receive the sliding bolts that lock into them. This is the purdy design. The metal protrusion from the rib 
above the ejectors shows the hole for the greener cross bolt. On the underside, further down about four inches, and mounted on the underside of the rib, there's a locking lug for the forearm release. Just forward of the barrel flat are inscriptions on both barrels, boiler steel and the caliber markings, 500-465 Nitro Express and proof marks. For other markings, the serial number appears again on the right side of the uh, underside of the barrel flat, 495, and the year manufacturer, 70. Turning the barrels around and over, now for a top view, you can see the maker's name, inscription showing clearly in gold fill engraved lettering, Johann, which is pronounced with a Y in German, Johann von Zoe Furlock, Austria, just behind the uh, rear express sight on the cross-hatched rib. Putting the barrels down and picking up the forearm. Now, notice the knife edge sides of the wood, allowing it to wrap around the barrels for this semi beaver tail forearm. This workmanship is impressive. There are no markings inside the forearm iron. As I turn it over, the forearm iron is engraved to match where it meets the action. Looking at the finished bottom side of the forearm, we see the grooved channel for the recessed Anson and Dealey forearm release. Notice the tight inletting of the very tiny points of the escutcheon. It is well designed, color case hardened, and engraved. Let's return to our main set and reassemble the rifle. To reassemble this rifle, again, it's the traditional double takedown design. Pick up the action, first hold the barrel assembly at 45 degrees to the action, raising the barrels until you hear it click, it's locked together. Next hold the forearm, also at 45 degrees, and insert it until you hear the Anson Dealey latch locks. <clears throat> when not using the gun, the action should not be cocked. Either snap the strikers with snap caps, or open the gun, take it off safe, and while holding both triggers back, close the, uh, close the action. <clears throat> How is the condition rated on this rifle? Overall, uh, the condition would be excellent plus showing a few light handling marks. Uh, mechanics and the bores are perfect. And the 500 to 465 cartridge for this, is it popular? I'm glad you asked that. I wanted to mention something about the caliber. Um, but to answer your question, it's not popular in this country, but it should be. It's a great performing cartridge designed, as I said, by Holland & Holland and nearly identical to the 470 Nitro Express, which is popular. Here's a little history of the 500-465, uh, though. In the late 1890s, the British Empire was faced with a series of internal insurrections in India and the Sudan, and the 450 caliber Martini Henry rifle was the most widely distributed firearm in the hands of the anti-British forces. Uh, because of that, in 1907, the British Army banned all 450 caliber sporting rifles and ammunition from importation hmm. into India and the Sudan. Two major destinations for the popular sporting cartridge, the 450 Nitro Express. While the 450 Nitro uh, cartridges would, could not be loaded in the Martini Henry rifles, it was uh, feared their bullets could be pulled and used in making ammo for them. What resulted, however, <clears throat> was a rush by British rifle and ammunition makers to develop a substitute sporting cartridge. Holland Holland created this 500-465 Nitro Express. Joseph Lang created the 470 Nitro Express. And Wesley Richards created the 476 Nitro Express. And there were some others. So our cartridge here is the 500-465 Nitro Express created by Holland Holland by necking down the 500 Nitro Express cartridge. The 500-465 NE was designed 
for use in single shot and double rifles as it's a rimmed cartridge. There's a fine testament to this cartridge published in the book Cartridges of the World by Frank C. Barnes, and I want to quote it here. I'm quoting, the 500-465 is rated as an excellent all-around number for Africa, including heavy or dangerous game. It is still tops for African game. Only one bullet weight is used, but those 480-grain slugs are available in solid, soft point, and metal-covered split types. With a bullet weight of 480 grains, the factory load gives a muzzle velocity of 2,150 feet per second, with an energy of 4,930 foot-pounds, close quote. That sounds like an awesome cartridge for Africa. Yes, it is, and brass is readily available from the popular 500 Nitro Express, which can be necked down for the hand loader. As a last note, I said this rifle comes with two cases. We just saw the leather presentation case. There's also a second one that's water-resistant, nearly airtight. It's a steel trunk case, enameled green with black foamed fitted component, component compartments for carrying both the rifle and the uh, box of ammunition. Both cases have keys and maker's labels. So to sum up, um, we only have to look at the maker's website to see their claims. They state that the family's continuous enthusiasm for their unique craft lives on and that together they have formed a dedicated team and follow a consistent niche policy with a commitment to top-notch uh, craftsmanship and design excellence. Today, the name Fanzoi stands for one of the world's premier guns, gun makers. Their webs, uh, the website states, and I want to quote that, Johan Fanzoi's firearms are mechanical masterpieces as well as objects of eternity a perfect blend of cutting-edge technology with centuries-old craftsmanship. Johann Fonzoy prides itself on producing the finest individual pieces for the most discerning and individual of people, ultra-customized creations for the adventure of a lifetime. Close quote. From examining this specimen of their fine work, I would say their claims are well-founded and have been fully and completely realized. That's it for today. Thank you, Gent Virginia. Thank you, viewers, for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, I invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel and share with others. And I hope you join us next week for another episode of Special Guns with Roger Rule. We'll be looking at another very special rifle. If you want to get involved with these types of guns, I recommend GunsInternational.com. The owners are great people. I know them and have been using their website since they started. I find it the best source for both buying and selling any great collectible gun.